Our next speaker is Eric Tishnik. He's the executive director of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, and he's been involved in underwater archaeology here and elsewhere for the past 30 years, and his presentation is entitled, The Almighty has been pleased to grant us a signal victory on Lake Champlain, naval activities on Lake Champlain during the War of 1812. And if I could just say quickly that um, there's going to be a Q&A session at the end, so if you have questions, we have a lot of time built in for question and answers at the end of uh, the afternoon session, so thanks. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. How about this scene, huh? Hard to believe this happened uh, 200 years ago right here on Lake Champlain. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what leads up to this, but why don't we take the next slide. Um, I've got really good news for you. Uh, with both Gary's uh, presentation on the events leading up uh, to the War of 1812 on Lake Champlain, uh, include, I'm going to keep you going here, Jesse, uh, including the Black Snake Affair uh, on the Onion River, uh, and with Amanda's excellent presentation on the events that were taking place, you are being spared a considerable amount of preamble by myself. So uh, what we have basically going on along the northern border of the United States with Canada is a whole series of conflicts with mixed results, as been, has already been pointed out. Uh, we can look to Perry's victory on Lake Erie as one of the outstanding events that takes place. The other stuff we really prefer not to talk about because a lot of it was pretty embarrassing along the border. Um, and Lake Ontario, you would think, would become a hotbed as well. And in fact, that was more of a shipbuilding war than it was an actual naval engagement. Both sides, the Americans and the British, will build up massive naval fleets on Lake Ontario, including up to uh, ships of the line. 100-gun vessels will be built on Lake Ontario. Uh, if you've seen the HMS Victory, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These were first-rate ships of the line. Neither commander actually got up the uh, gumption to go after the other, and it never came to a fight. On Lake Champlain, uh, she will be the, the third body of water that will uh, take place in this, but not much is going to happen up until 1814. And what you see is a 120-mile highway north-south, the French and Indian War, the American Revolution. One historian described Lake Champlain as a dagger pointed deep into the heart of the United States. If you had control of it, you could invade either north or south and the War of 1812 was going to prove no different. However, when war broke out, uh, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot going on in naval affairs. In fact, the Navy had, it, we talked about the ill-prepared nature of the United States in entering this war. They had one naval officer on Lake Champlain when the war break out, or broke out. Lieutenant Sidney Smith uh, would go to this location, Basin Harbor. This is a contemporary painting. Uh, by Ernie Haas, and we can see uh, the Vermont One, our first steamboat uh, on the waters here. Uh, here he would find, in fact, two gunboats. They had been built in 1809 to help support uh, the efforts against the, uh, to support the embargo, efforts against the smugglers that were here. Uh, but those gunboats by 1812 were pretty run down, and in fact had largely sunk Take it from my experience, if you build a wooden boat and you don't do much with it over five years, it will sink, trust me. Uh, and so he takes these boats and, and uh, starts to fix them up uh, through the summer of uh, 1812 uh, to make a presence on Lake Champlain for the Americans. Today, if you go to Basin Harbor, you can see the site of the naval shipyard, uh, 1804 to 1812. The monument was probably more impressive than the shipyard itself. So Thomas McDonough doesn't show up on the scene until October of 1812, uh, and immediately he's, he's got, although young at 29 years of age, he has a considerable amount of naval experience uh, and takes matters into his own hands. Uh, the Army already has six vessels on Lake Champlain, sloops, merchant vessels that they are now using uh, for the transportation of troops and supplies, McDonough commandeers three of these sloops. Uh, the sloops are not overly impressive. They were designed as merchantmen, and they went about converting them into war vessels. By all accounts, they weren't uh, really 
I guess from a, a, a uh, sailor's standpoint, they're a little bit scary. When you put a lot of armament on an upper deck, uh, on a vessel that wasn't designed to have a lot of armament, uh, it can become top heavy. So these weren't he uh, entirely trusted. Uh, the vessels are named President, Hunter, and Bulldog. Uh, the president, uh, by the end of 1812, we're coming into 1813 now, as they're doing the work on these, they've done them, the work in Whitehall, they've done some work in Shelburne as well, uh, and by 1813, McDonough is out on Lake Champlain. The president runs into a little mishap up in Plattsburgh, is badly damaged, and is up for repairs. The other two vessels, which have now been renamed Eagle and Growler, are under the command of that first commander, uh, Sidney Smith, who takes them, and McDonough gives them orders. He said, go up, make sure that the British aren't actually, not yet, sorry, I didn't mean to point. I'll try to, I'll keep my hands down. Until <laughs> Maybe we should do the beep. We'll do the next one. All right. Uh, so uh, Lieutenant Sidney Smith uh, heads up on orders to make sure that the British don't come out of the Richelieu River. Uh, and uh, he's told not to go across the border. Stay up there, but don't go across the border. Unfortunately, uh, Sidney Smith does go across the border into the Richelieu River. Uh, the British have three gunboats awaiting him, uh, as well as army forces on land. As he proceeds down the Richelieu River, he gets caught in a pretty heavy and sustained fire for about four hours, uh, now trying to beat his way back out of the Richelieu River and fighting the current, he finds himself in a pretty uncompromising position. The eagle and the growler are captured. American control of Lake Champlain has suddenly shifted. Now, the British have just gotten themselves two new sloops. They've got their three gunboats. They load up 47 bateaux with 1,000 men. And under uh, the Army commander, Lieutenant Colonel Murray, they head up Lake Champlain in 1813, very much in control of the scene. They head to Plattsburgh. Uh, in Plattsburgh, any public property will be burned. Private property will be looted. Uh, they send off a small contingent over to the Swanton uh, Army Contonement, which is also ransacked. Uh, and then the main force heads over to Burlington. Now, the president has been uh, restored. The couple of gunboats are there. And of course, the battery in Burlington will come in quite handy. And after about a 30-minute exchange, the British do decide, okay, we've had enough of this. Uh, we're not going to try to do anything with Burlington any further, uh, but we are going to turn our attention to the shipping on Lake Champlain. The merchantmen that were out there will not be pleased as the British now unchecked rove around Lake Champlain, burning anywhere from four to five merchant vessels, including the 50-ton Essex we see here, uh, set in flames and adrift uh, after being ransacked. Uh, we, I guess we could say, you know, Commodore Perry's enjoying victory over on, uh, on Lake Erie on September 10th of 1813. McDonough, not so much. Uh, 1813 was an embarrassing year for the American Navy on Lake Champlain. Uh, they had lost control uh, of the lake. Um, he does, however, commandeer some more sloops, uh, and with that presence, the British retire up into Canada, and that's pretty much where they're checked uh, through the end of the year. So I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page with the geography of what's going on here. Um, I mentioned a couple locations where they had done some work on vessels, uh, including Shelburne Bay. I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with that. Uh, Whitehall, at the very southern extreme of Lake Champlain, uh, that had been where um, just 30 plus, 40 years prior, uh, Benedict Arnold had built the American fleet at what was then known as Skeensboro, so they were still doing some ship work down there. Uh, the location of the shipyard or the, the gunboats when uh, uh, Lieutenant Smith took over was right on Lake Champlain just outside Virgins, Vermont. Uh, and the other point of interest in addition to Burlington and Plattsburgh is Illinois. Uh, that would be the location where the, uh, the Navy will be staging their shipbuilding activities for the British just across the border. Um, so with that, uh, McDonough's looking at the situation going, all right, I want to build some more boats. He is granted permission to do so. Uh, he's looking at these locations of Whitehall, Shelburne, Burlington, uh, Basin Harbor, all being right on Lake Champlain and decides that he'd rather have a location that was more secure uh, and safe to do so. 
Uh, he selects the town of Vergennes, Vermont, uh, as his shipbuilding location uh, in the winter, fall of 1813, going into uh, the winter of 1814. Uh, Vergennes was desirable on several accounts. First of all, it was not right on Lake Champlain, and yet you could navigate it, uh, navigate to it up to seven miles uh, of the Otter Creek. Uh, and so we're looking here now, you can see the community of Virgens, uh, the road to Basin Harbor, uh, which is on the right-hand side of the river, uh, and then the mouth of the Otter Creek. Uh, Virgens had several advantages. Number one was the 40-foot uh, set of falls, the natural falls there had already been uh, captured and utilized for water power, and there were numerous mills along uh, the falls. In addition, and perhaps even more importantly, was on the uh, south side of the river, to the right of the screen here, uh, was the Moncton Ironworks. The Moncton Ironworks uh, was producing enough uh, iron fastenings and fittings to make it one of the larger in the country at the time. Um, so McDonough had the water power uh, and the location that he needed uh, to support shipbuilding efforts. In addition, it was defendable. Being seven miles up the Otter Creek, any landing forces would have to go overland or at least control the Otter Creek uh, in order to be able to attack his boats while they were under construction. He did not have a firm grasp or control of Lake Champlain, uh, and so he sent uh, Lieutenant Stephen Casson uh, down to the mouth of Otter Creek in order to build a battery. And we can see the battery. I'm going to go ahead and... So we have the, uh, the uh, mouth of the Otter Creek coming out here. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Stephen Cassett, which will now be called Fort Cassett. And you can even see that uh, on this particular diagram shown the, the range of the gun batteries. Uh, and they've also positioned a couple of gunboats to, to secure some other areas that may be weak points in this defense. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> here it is. Got it. <laughs> so... Um, is this strategy successful? On both counts, I would argue. Uh, first of all, in May of 1814, the British do come up Lake Champlain. They too have been busy up on Illinois. Uh, they now have a 16-gun uh, vessel, uh, the uh, Linnet, uh, along with several other boats uh, and about 1,000 troops as they advance up Lake Champlain with the full intent of burning McDonough's fleet uh, in Shelburne, or excuse me, in Virgins. Uh, they advance upon this position, about an hour and 15 minute firefight ensues. The British cannot advance close enough uh, to effect the landing, and of course as all the commotion is taking place, more and more militia are showing up along the shoreline. Uh, as the British will say, there's a Jonathan behind every tree. Uh, and so the attempt to attack uh, the shipyard uh, is successfully thwarted uh, in May uh, of 1814. What is McDonough up to uh, during the winter of 1814? Uh, he's been busy building row galleys. Uh, they'll build a half a dozen of these. I love the names of these. The Boar, the Burrows, the Centipede, the Nettle, the Viper. Uh, all very prickly things. Uh, and we'll see these 75 foot long gunboats uh, will be pretty substantial. Uh, they're also referred to as row galleys because they are indeed rowed. Uh, you'd have to have 40 individuals rowing one of these boats. Don't be fooled, although they're low profiled and only have one gun on either end, each of those guns, both the long cannon and the carronades, are very heavy guns. Uh, and also these boats are 75 feet in length. Uh, one of the downsides to these boats, uh, they do have two masts and can be sailed, uh, but one of the downsides is you do need so many crew uh, in order to move them. And those crew were in very high demand as more ships were being cranked out. Um, this is a, a painting, contemporary, uh, of the, one of the gunboats and what it might have looked like on Lake Champlain. Uh, this is currently on uh, exhibition at the Maritime Museum. We have an exhibit on uh, marine art uh, from the American uh, Maritime so Artists Society uh, down at the Maritime Museum, which will be on display only through Sunday. So if you're interested in maritime art, it's an excellent opportunity to see some wonderful pieces, including this one. So the other thing that McDonough is doing is building uh, very large boats. Uh, the flagship of his fleet, or what will become his flagship, the Corvette Saratoga, uh, is completed. 
I should mention that this is not local talent necessarily uh, that's going into these, although I'm sure local labor was incorporated into it. Uh, these are professional shipwrights that have come from New York City. In this case, it's Adam and Noah Brown, the same individuals who pulled off the miracle over on Lake Erie with Perry's fleet uh, being able to construct boats in extremely adverse conditions. If you think it's hard to get materials into the Champlain Valley uh, in 1813, 1814, try getting them to Lake Erie. Uh, a very difficult task indeed, and yet amazing uh, results are produced. Uh, Noah Brown comes up here uh, with a couple of hundred shipwrights, uh, and uh, within just a 40-day period of time, uh, McDonough's flagship is going into the water uh, in Virgins. Don't let that fool you. It takes a lot longer to arm them and to put mass and rigging on them as well. Uh, so, uh, but nonetheless, an amazing shipbuilding feat uh, is accomplished. This is what the Saratoga would have looked like, uh, our best guess, and also based upon uh, uh, images from the time, not pictures, but drawings uh, of the time, uh, a rather impressive uh, vessel. And yet, nonetheless, McDonough's going to go for more, uh, including uh, the schooner Ticonderoga. Uh, the Ticonderoga uh, was actually laid down uh, by the steamboat company in Virgins uh, and was planned to be the second steamboat on Lake Champlain. McDonough had an option there. Uh, he could have been the first naval commander in history to have a steam-powered warboat uh, and choose, chose not to do that. Uh, he went with the tried and true sail. And let's face it, early steam technology was a little dicey. Uh, the thought of putting a burning uh, furnace inside of your boat uh, and uh, the original Vermont one was subject to frequent breakdowns. He was probably smart to go with something that he knew uh, and could rely upon. Uh, so the Ticonderoga added substantial firepower uh, to McDonough's fleet. Uh, this is a contemporary painting done by uh, Ernie Haas once again, uh, and this is the scene you might have seen in very early uh, spring of 1814 in Virgins, Vermont. You can see the, the falls in the background with the ironworks belching out some smoke on the right-hand bank. Uh, we can see the... We can see the Ticonderoga over here uh, uh, being under construction. The six gunboats lined up and now going down the ways into the water, uh, as well as uh, the, um, the Saratoga up here uh, in the stocks. So uh, quite an active uh, scene uh, taking place. The exact location of this uh, shipyard is still under some debate, and my coworker, Chris Sabic, I bet will shed a little bit of light on that for us later. So with all of this activity, you'd think, geez, McDonough's in pretty good shape. Uh, he should be able to take on the British without too much uh, effort. Uh, but what he's beginning to hear is that, that there's a very large vessel uh, being constructed up on Illinois, uh, something that may outclass him. Uh, and so he's getting a bit antsy, a bit nervous. And despite the fact that he had written to Secretary of the Navy William Jones uh, boasting about his uh, successes on Lake Champlain and ship construction, he was now becoming increasingly concerned that the British may be uh, achieving the upper hand. Uh, and so he writes to Jones repeatedly, please, I need to build one more boat. I want to put a brig on the water. Uh, and William Jones has spent a considerable amount of money uh, on the shipbuilding efforts on all of the Great Lakes, uh, and Lake Champlain was no different. And I love this quote, I see no end to this war of broad axes. Uh, he refuses repeatedly McDonough's pleas to build another vessel, uh, and ultimately it will be uh, President Madison who steps in and says, let McDonough build another boat. Uh, we want to make sure that we maintain control of the lake. I realize by 1814, uh, as Amanda uh, told us earlier, uh, the, the British have pretty much neutralized uh, uh, Napoleon. And so they're turning around and looking at it and they go, oh yeah, what's going on over here? Oh yeah, right, uh, the Americans uh, are up to something. And they really want an opportunity to punch us in the nose. If they can get the upper hand, perhaps they can gain some uh, bargaining at the table uh, and put an end to this with a little bit more um, uh, weight on their side uh, for the negotiations. So uh, they're looking at uh, making a point on Lake Champlain. The Americans, uh, once again, with the, with the, um, 
with the consent of Madison to now build this boat, uh, Adam uh, Brown, Noah's brother, is sent north with a crew of men. Uh, McDonough doesn't even realize he's on the way until he shows up, which, which must have been a great relief. Uh, and from the day of um, Adam Brown's arrival until the launch of the 120-foot brig Eagle uh, is a period of just 19 days. Uh, it's truly an astounding, uh, by anybody's book, uh, an astounding uh, a f feat of uh, ship construction. Uh, the vessel continues to be uh, rigged out, and this is actually the Niagara, uh, which is over on Lake Erie, uh, one of Perry's vessels, which has been reconstructed. There is, I guess, a little bit of original timber, but not a whole lot. But this uh, gives you a very good idea of what the Brig Eagle would have looked like uh, here on Lake Champlain. So here's the scene. McDonough now has his full complement of vessels. Uh, he is in Plattsburgh Bay on September 11th. Uh, the British Army is advanced up into Plattsburgh, um, and the American Army, unfortunately, has been substantially weakened because a large contingent has been sent west where they thought another attack was going to take place. The American Army will be bolstered by militia, including Vermont militia, even though they had been... Uh, coined as even traitorous by supplying the British with some of their uh, materials. The militia will pour out uh, when the uh, rubber hits the road, so to speak. Uh, they'll row across Lake Champlain and join their New York counterparts along the banks of the Saranac River. But the real contest uh, in Lake Champlain is going to happen on the lake itself. The British know they have to control the supply line of Lake Champlain. They must have a naval victory. Um, Downey is in command of the British fleet. Uh, the, the, the additional vessel that was under construction uh, would become his flagship, the Confiance or Confiance, uh, and indeed was the, the, is the largest sailing vessel to have ever sailed on Lake Champlain. Um, He's being put under a tremendous amount of pressure. The uh, British commander on land is saying, look, we've got to make this attack. Winter is coming. It's September already. Let's get this show on the road. Downey had just so shown up on the scene. Uh, he was unfamiliar with his vessels and his crews, uh, but felt the pressure and now was sailing into battle really with an incomplete boat. And when I say incomplete, they actually stopped on the outside of Cumberland Head. Downey went on shore to do a little reconnaissance and also gave an opportunity to drop off the carpenters who were still continuing to work on the boat uh, before it went into battle. Um, he gets back on his boat and rounds the corner, and what he finds is that the Americans have anchored themselves uh, in a line of battle in Plattsburgh Bay. Seen here. Um, he sails around the corner. His intent uh, is to bring the con confiance in, uh, rake the eagle, which is at the north end of the line, and then position himself at the end of the Saratoga and provide a raking fire. This is all about positioning. When you're in a naval battle, you want to be able to get yourself in an advantageous position, typically upwind if possible. And the other thing you'd like to be able to do, and this is the, the, the devastating uh, maneuver, if you can get your broadside, the side of your boat with all its guns, uh, pointed down the length of someone's boat, which is basically defenseless, you now have your full firepower going down the length of the boat. Shot will literally go in the front, We'll go the length of the boat and blow out the back end. Uh, and that's what uh, Downey was hoping to accomplish by breaking uh, McDonough's line. Um, it doesn't go very well uh, for him. Let's go ahead and do the next slide. Um, here's the U.S. Naval positioning. Uh, we have, we're just going to crank through them here, uh, the Corvette Saratoga. We're, we're, you have to imagine we're standing now in Plattsburgh looking out towards Cumberland Bay so the American vessels are closer to us. The 26-gun Saratoga. Uh, we have the 20-gun Brig Eagle to the north of that. We also have the schooner Ticonderoga, the steamboat gone uh, schooner for us. Uh, and we also have the sloop Preble of nine guns. And in addition, uh, we have the total of uh, 10 row galleys that are uh, constructed and now in the engagement. So notice something about McDonough's boats and all of this. They are anchored. Uh, he's in an in a anchored position uh, awaiting the British. 
Now, the British sail around the corner, and they're advancing on his position. And one thing that I think Downey underestimated was the, the extent of the breeze and the amount he had to go into it. There's a northwest breeze that day, uh, which hampered his progress. Um, Downey had more long guns, uh, which would have had a little less firepower, but a longer range to them. It would have behooved him to stay back a little bit and pound, him, uh, pound McDonough, uh, but he really wanted to close on him because he had slightly superior firepower. Um, the Americans had more of those short-range heavy guns, the carronades, and so it was really to McDonough's advantage the closer that the British uh, pushed their engagement. Well, as the British uh, advance upon the Americans uh, and they're having slow progress, uh, they're being pounded by American gunfire the entire trip in. Uh, in fact, the British flagship uh, will lose several of her anchors uh, as they come into the battle. Um, the first shot that supposedly crossed the, the uh, deck of the Saratoga uh, by popular lore struck the chicken coop uh, on the boat. Uh, a uh, rather plucky rooster uh, flew from that coop, landed on a gun, and started crowing. Uh, this uh, brought great um, courage, I guess, uh, good cheer to the crew who shouted out uh, as it, they went into battle. Um, what ensued uh, was Downey's plan kind of fell apart. Let's go continue on and take a look at where the British ships are in this scene. Uh, the 37-gun frigate Confiance. Uh, we have the uh, brig Linnet of 16 guns going to the north end of the line, successfully gets into the position she wants where she can uh, fire upon the Eagle. And we also have uh, two sloops, the, the Chubb and Finch. Those, by the way, are the two that were lost by the Americans, the Eagle and the Growler, up on the Richelieu River. Uh, and the British have also brought their own series of row galleys as well. Um, for the next two hours, the two sides will stand off of one another and pound each other. And you have to understand the, the devastating fire of this. Uh, a lot of the American guns are 32 and 42 pound carronades. Uh, it's a considerable b size ball. And unlike the Constitution, which we're gonna hear about a little bit later, the old iron sides effect, um, which had side planks on it, upwards of a foot thick, made out of live oak. Uh, the boats on Lake Champlain were approximately two inch thick planking, made of white oak. And yet the guns were just as heavy as those found on the Constitution. As my dear friend and fellow Captain Walter Ribka of the Niagara says, it was a lot like floating eggshells fighting with hammers. Uh, this was absolutely devastating. These boats were being torn apart. Uh, fragments of these boats were flying everywhere, and the rigging was also coming down. Uh, twice during the get down, uh, within 15 minutes of the start of the engagement, was killed. One of the guns on board his boat was struck in the muzzle by an American cannonball, came off its carriage, and struck him. Uh, he died of internal hemorrhaging. Uh, McDonough was knocked down twice during this engagement, uh, once by getting struck by the severed head of one of his sailors, and a second time by falling rigging coming out of the, out of the tops of his vessels. Uh, so the, the battle to say it was heated uh, would be a certain understatement. So how does this finally end? Um, well, one of the things that McDonough had done during his strategy was uh, employing a spring system on his anchors. We can see all those anchor lines going out, and in addition, there were also spring lines. A lot of people hear, oh yeah, he employed his anchors and used springs. What does that mean? Uh, we've done some experimenting with our own gunboat at the Maritime Museum, uh, the Philadelphia, uh, and we believe they may have also done this at Valcor Island with Benedict Arnold's fleet. Um, and it's very simply just adding an additional line on your anchors. So in this case, we have a two anchor spring, pretty simplified. Uh, anchor, right now, lines one and two are taut. Uh, if you want to turn your boat, simply slack lines one and two and haul on lines three and four and the boat will turn around and does it quite handily. Uh, with the smaller flat bottom gunboats that Arnold was dealing with, it happens very quickly. Would have been a slower maneuver to say the least with something like the Saratoga, uh, but nonetheless uh, proved effective. So here's the scene once again. Now we're over on the opposite side. Uh, we're on the uh, Cumberland head side looking back towards the, the engagement that's taking place. Probably understated on the amount of smoke that would have been billowing out of this scene. Um, but uh, 
During this battle, you can imagine now the two sides of the uh, American flagships have been battered uh, significantly. Guns are overturned and becoming weakened. Uh, and so McDonough employs his spring system and is able to turn his vessel around. Uh, the crew of the Confiance uh, attempts the same maneuver. Uh, remember, they've lost several of their anchors, so they're greatly impaired. Uh, they manage to turn their boat halfway and get stuck, and they get caught in that devastating raking fire. Uh, at this point, uh, it will be only a matter of minutes before the Confiance strikes her colors. Um, I can go into the details of the other uh, vessels, but suffice to say that uh, it won't be long before the other boats strike their colors, and we can see the British gunboats fleeing uh, back around the corner. They're the only ones to not be captured uh, during this engagement. It was an all-out victory. Uh, the, the land battle that is uh, now taking place on shore as the gunfire begins to peter out uh, on the lake, they take a gander out. They realize that the British uh, have been defeated uh, and the British uh, on land begin to pack up and uh, turn around and head in the other direction. Um, McDonough immediately goes to work uh, to repair these boats in an attempt to save them um, and to, uh, he very humanely uh, puts his doctors to work on both uh, crews from the Americans as well as the British vessels uh, to, to uh, stem off some of the devastation that's happened. Um, but uh, McDonough's victory is celebrated widely, uh, including the Americans who are already in Ghent uh, negotiating a treaty. When word arrives of uh, McDonough's victory, the British realize that one of their main offensive in the northern part of the country uh, has been defeated. Uh, this is when the, the uh, terms uh, quicken for the end of this war uh, and that status quo antebellum uh, that we talked about earlier. So. Um, Historians, uh, and, and I'm not the only one, uh, this naval engagement was one of the more significant of uh, the war. Uh, take Winston Churchill's uh, words for it. Uh, he believed it, uh, and even um, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt uh, would commend th um, Thomas McDonough, saying he's one of the best naval commanders uh, that the Americans will see right up and through the Civil War. Um, so uh, needless to say, uh, a, a pretty important engagement uh, here on Lake Champlain. Thank you very much.